Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this next uh, part, a uh, very timely, unfortunately very sad uh, series of conversations that uh, we are hosting under the auspices of the Azriel Institute of Israel Studies. My name is Chaba Nikolini. I'm a professor of political science and also director of the Institute. And uh, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, massacre that uh, took place, in uh, Otef Aza, in the Gaza envelope on October 7th, we um, immediately uh, started reaching out to our partners, uh, friends, uh, colleagues uh, in Israel to uh, ask them and ask them to join us in a conversation to actually bring awareness to what this terrible tragedy meant and means to them. And today, um, normally I would say I'm delighted I'm not going to use that word now. I'm just going to say that today we are welcoming three uh, very dear colleagues and friends from Sapir Academic College, uh, Dr. Uh, Amit Maranskal, uh, Head of Academic Internationalization at the college, Dr. Shlomi Balaban, uh, a graduate, or uh, sorry, a faculty at the, uh, at the college. And I want to add that Shlomi also is a recent PhD and the recipient of the best dissertation award for his work that was uh, given to him by the Association for Israel Studies at its recent meeting in, uh, in New York. Uh, and we are also delighted to have with us uh, uh, Hila Kali, uh, Hila, uh, from a uh, former graduate, a graduate of Sapir Academic College, uh, who finished an MA uh, at Sapir and who is currently working uh, with an NGO uh, organizing various voluntary activities very much related to uh, to the war effort. And we're going to hear from Hila more details about that. So um, just a very quick word before I would turn the floor over to uh, our guest. Uh, those of you who may not know, uh, Sapir, more than any other academic institution in Israel, of course, is very deeply and uh, in a very concrete and personal sense, uh, was and is affected by the tragedy, uh, if for no other reason by virtue of its physical location. Uh, being situated in Sderot, um, it's, um, Sapir just couldn't, uh, just, just very deeply and very, very directly affected by everything that happened and has been unfolding. So, um, welcome, Amit, Shlomi, and Hila. Thank you for joining us today. And um, we have an hour. And uh, um, I suggest that we try to divide our time amongst the three of you um, up to about uh, quarter to one o'clock our time, uh, quarter to eight uh, your time in Israel. And um, that would allow us to take some uh, questions and answers. Um, so um, maybe we'll go in the same order in which I introduced you. So Amit, please um, share with us your your insights, um, and then Shlomi and Hila. So, um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Right. So, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Chaba and the Israeli Institute for Israel Studies for putting uh, together this event. And also my dear friends, Shlomi and Lee, for, for making this connection. Um, as I wrote you on WhatsApp earlier, I would like to start with uh, reading the names of our beloved colleagues and students from Sapir College who were brutally murdered by Hamas terrorists on Saturday, October 7. Ophir Liebstein, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Negev College and a member of the Board of Trustees. Mati Weiss, Faculty Member. Shlomi Matias, Faculty Member. Yasmin Zohar, coordinator of the Faculty Association. Yasmin was uh, murdered with her two daughters and husband, and their 13-year-old son miraculously survived. Ronit Sultan, faculty, also murdered with her husband. Sivan El Kabetz, computer science student. Yav Wiener, administrative staff. Cindy Flash, who is very um, close to the people in the Zoom. Cindy Flash, administrative staff. She was murdered with her husband, Eagle Flash, who is also a faculty member, was a faculty member, excuse me. Renat Zegev Evan, a student. And along with them, there were 14 Sapir graduates, 14 Sapir graduates who were murdered. 
יהי זכרם ברוך, may their memory be blessed. We are also praying with our colleague Lishai Lavi, whose husband Omri was taken hostage and is in Gaza right now. We pray for the return of over 200 hostages, excuse me, babies, children, teenagers, parents, grandparents, and soldiers. Um, we're praying them to come back home. Pray for them to come back home. Let me just take a deep breath and I'll be able to continue. So as you can imagine, for the past uh, two weeks, we have been busy um, going from one funeral to the next, supporting each other and those who were um, who have lost their loved ones and have deeply been affected by the uh, massacre on October 7. I'd like to tell you a bit about Sapir College and um, and how you know we're, we're managing to function these days. So Sapir is located in the Western Negev. It's less than two miles from the Gaza border. And it's one of Israel's largest public colleges so with about 8,000 students participating in academic and vocational programs. Sapir has uh, 15 undergraduate uh, programs and nine graduate de degree tracks in a wide range of disciplines from law school to social work to film school and economics. And the college's mission really is, is to provide a high quality, equitable and accessible higher education in Israel's southern periphery, which offers students life-changing and social mobility. Um, life-changing economic and social mobility, excuse me. Sapir is, um, is the largest employer in the Western Negev and is an, an engine of growth in a region which is really so critical to Israel's economy, security and society. I have to say that, um, you know, everything we do at, at Sapir College is, is virtually measured against the question, how will the community around us benefit from this or that activity or program? Long before, you know, social impact was, was a term and was a trendy term, we were doing social impact. And it's really part of our institutional DNA. It's, we, we've, we wouldn't, we were never and we will never be an, an ivory tower kind of institution. We're really deeply embedded in the community around us. And now that um, the community around us has been devastated, including the Sapir campus, our role is to start putting it back together and resume our critical role as a rehabilitation center and an engine growth and a pillar in the midst of chaos. Um, as you all know, on Saturday morning, Hamas terrorists uh, launched the war, brutally murdering more than 1,300 Israelis, taking an estimated 200 hostage and injuring about 3,000. Many of these people studied, worked, or taught at Sapir College, and in parallel, and over the years, thousands of rockets were, were and still are launched in an ongoing attack on Israel. The devastation in the South is uh, unfathomable. Homes and communities have been totally destroyed, entire families murdered together. Sapir students and staff have experienced unbearable horrors. Over 250 Sapir staff are, are local, along with over 500 students who live in Sderot and hundreds more in local kibbutzim, all living in the Gaza envelope. Many have lost loved ones or their loved ones, have been taken hostage, or they're caring for those injured themselves, and they have lost their homes and possessions. Um, so that is the current situation at Sapir, and last time we had a very big faculty meeting, thinking together how we can, you know, under the circumstances, still open the semester and signal that 
we are a lighthouse in, in the midst of of the catastrophic events and the chaos around us. So this is um, where we're at at this point. Thank you so much, Amit. Thank you. And uh, please do know that uh, we are very much uh, with you uh, in your prayers uh, for uh, uh, for this um, revival. Uh, Shlomi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chaba, and all the organizers. Amit, thank you, Lien. Um, I'll try to be brief because I know that Hila has to speak and it's not going to be easy for her. So um, let me just say um, that I'm currently in Canada. I'm a visiting researcher at the uh, Faculty of Law of the University of Ottawa. So the uh, on the 7th of October, um, I woke up in the morning and got the fifth, as always, I took my cellular and I opened it. Um, and then I began to receive all kinds of WhatsApps and emails. And, uh, and uh, I was quite shocked. And I've actually been experiencing uh, this nightmare for the last uh, almost three weeks uh, with like sort of a hellish di dichotomy between Israel and Canada. So I, I, I've been also experiencing what, uh, let's say, uh, for example, Jewish students have been uh, experiencing in the in campuses, and I've been part of demonstrations. I've seen what's going on outside, and um, I must say that I've received emails and phone calls from uh, people all over the world, from my colleagues in uh, Max Planck in Frankfurt and also from the University of Ottawa, which is quite remarkable because I've only been here since the beginning of September, but people are interested. Um, and I've been keep, I've been asked, uh, the first, the first thing is, um, is my family okay? And I, I immediately say, yeah, my, uh, my biological family is okay. But, um, uh, Sapir is a community. Sapir is, is like a big family. And the, you know, the theory of the six degrees of separation, that first of all, that doesn't apply to Israel because in Israel it's like maximum, let's say, three degrees of separation. But when you talk about Sapir College, I mean, we know uh, people that we worked with, that we drank coffee with, ate together. Um, told gossip to one another. Friends. And this this horrific attack is 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 mind blowing. It really is. Um, as for the campus, I've seen footage that everything is okay on campus, but let's bear in mind that we, we've been targeted as a campus for years by rockets. Um, dur during semester, suddenly you will hear a siren. Um, and there were, there was a, a period in which there were um, uh, balloons with explosives there was a, a really huge fire near campus and so on. So we've been targeted throughout the years. And I thought to myself that it's kind of part of my pride that I'm working in Sapir and that we have such a amazing campus with um, Jews and Arabs and uh, seculars and Orthodox and so on. The actually probably one of the most uh, diverse uh, campuses in Israel, really mosaic of the Israeli society. Um, I didn't imagine that everything like, something like that will happen. Uh, but I have no doubt in my mind that we will return to campus and we'll 
teach and research and have new students, but uh, we won't be the same. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shlomi. Uh, Hila, would you like to share a few words with us? Um, yes, I'm Hila. And because of my uh, bad English, uh, Galia Nankin here will uh, speak uh, for me. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's very nice to meet you. And I really wish uh, we had uh, met under different uh, circumstances. Um, I'm here to tell you the story. Can you all hear me well before I yes. continue? Yes, thank you, Gaia. Yeah. Um, so I'm here to tell you the story of Yuri. Yuri is a bachelor and master's degree graduate um, at Superior College. He survived the massacre in Kibbutz Baraza over a little bit than two weeks. Um, before we're going to talk about <laughs> the October 7th, um, you need to understand that Yuri is not in contact with his family since the age of 10. Uh, he left the ultra-Orthodox life in Bnei Brak, uh, and he lived in the street for a couple of years. Um, he was managed to uh, rehabilitate himself with an organization like Beta Shanti and other organizations that help young kids, you know, to stand up and have a better life. Uh, he studied his bachelor degree in uh, social work and his master's in administration and public policy in Sapir. Uh, he was, oh, is, oh, was oh, is, um, also very engaged with the community. Um, he was the chairman of the student union of Sapir uh, College, and he also was part of the in, in charge of uh, social engagement. Um, he was very active and People really, really loved him um, during his time in college. Uh, his last position, uh, Amit mentioned before, um, of, of Pierre Lipstein. Um, so he was his assistant. Uh, it was a position of trust and he helped him. Um, and unfortunately, Ophir was murdered on in the morning uh, of October 7th. And um, everything started uh, when at 6.20 in the morning, um, Yuri is hearing, you know, the, the red alarm and he's going into the, the protected space, um, in his home in Faraza. About an hour later, um, they started hearing gunshots and, and over the kibbutz. At a certain point, uh, the terrorists threw grenades, you know, bombs on, on the house. Now, in, I don't know if you know, but we have like those, some houses, especially in those areas have the, it, it's just, it's a room, but at the end of the day, you know, if they're burning your house, you're going to burn with it. Um, he was, he had a little bit of luck and he had a window. Uh, so we opened there uh, the, the window so we can't, you know, so we can breathe a little bit of fresh air. Um, and then he saw that he has no other choice and he have to, he needs to leave the, from the window when outside they were waiting, uh, three terrorists. Uh, with Kalachnikovs and knives uh, waiting for him. Um, so he just told them in English that he, you know, he just, he had no weapon and he just wants to leave. Um, so they decided to kidnap him. Uh, and while he was walking towards Gaza, um, two of them left and he stayed with uh, one terrorist and he had a knife. Um, Yuri is in a good condition, <laughs> so he started running towards the towards the the trees, and he found a place where he can hide, and that that's where he hide for like four hours. In those four hours, um, there are a lot, you know, people got murdered. You hear other people in his kibbutz that are kidnapped, and after four hours, the IDF forces uh, arrived to the area. Um, but it wasn't safe yet. So they told him that he needs to hide in a building, one of the tallest buildings in the kibbutz. Um, there are a lot of uh, Hamas stories also in this building. And he had to wait there another seven hours um, before they could um, rescue him and move him to another place. So only a day after, um, at 10 a.m., uh, the IDF forces moved him to, and the other survivors um, from Kfar Aza to a gas station and from there to a safer place um, in the central of Israel. Um, Yuri uh, 
survived <laughs> thanks to a lot of luck and faith. Uh, while his friends, his boss, relatives, and the only place he has, um, everything was burnt. A lot of people killed, kidnapped. And I don't know, I think it's going to be years till we're going to realize and till all stories are going to be told because we, we, I think we're just starting to understand everything that happened there. Um, I, it's very important for me to mention that Yuri was not a kibbutz member. Uh, Yuri doesn't have a family. Uh, Yuri is a, doesn't have a job now. Um, and we're trying to see how we can help him. Uh, and we really hope after this war is going to, after this war, he can come back and can make an impact and can help, you know, bring, start building everything from scratch. In that, in that area. Uh, Gaia and Hila, thank you so much for uh, sharing this um, very, uh, very moving personal, uh, personal story. Um, and um, we're just um, grateful that this is a story of survival and uh, continue it. And we look towards um, hope and for a successful new beginning for Yuri and everyone else in the situation that um that, that that they share with him uh maybe hila and gila if you don't mind let me just maybe ask a few questions in a reverse order and maybe start with with this particular uh yuri story can you tell us so what does yuri do now and uh, are you in contact with him do you know um what he does uh, you mentioned that he is now left with no employment um so what opportunities can there be for him and for perhaps other students or survivors like him, either at Sapir or in the community at large? And um, let me also connect this to a broader question. And maybe this is something that uh, Shlomi and Amit, um, you could also, if you feel like, uh, engage uh, this question. What can academic institutions or colleagues or friends elsewhere in the world, such as us, uh, on this side of the ocean, um, what can, and this is a question that of course we hear all the time on this side of the ocean, what can we do? There are federations, there are communities that organize the collection of funds, but here in this particular case, we are, you, you shared with us a very concrete personal story and the personal needs. So what can, how, what can people do if anyone is moved, if anyone can, um, to support what are the options what what would help you what would help yuri what would help sapir what would help some of the programs i imagine and i'm talking way longer than i should but you did mention amit that um that sapir has many many programs that uh the success of which is measured by social impact and of course that is now going to be a whole new chapter is going to have to start because the communities have been devastated, traumatized. So um, it will take effort and a lot of resources to start the program, academically speaking, but also rebuild the community that provides that supportive infrastructure for the success of your program. So I know it's probably too early to talk about strategy, but, um, but to the extent that you can share thoughts even, how, what would you need to restart? It's a good question. It's a big question, and it's um, it's true that we don't have a strategy yet, but we do have the Sapir vision and uh, what we like to call the Sapir spirit, and uh, it will prevail. You know, we we will continue to uh, to be that lighthouse uh, of forward thinking and and high quality higher education um, that will not disappear. Uh, but then again, our lives have been completely transformed. We will never be the same again. So on a technical level, you know, we put together a, a, a fund for faculty and employees, Sapir employees. Uh, we call it the Basic Needs and Trauma Fund um, for resiliency treatments and really basic needs. Um, you have to understand that the people in Israel from the Kibbutzim or, or Sderot places that have been evacuated are all grouped together in um, um, in hotels or you know different cities that can accommodate them. 
Um, and you is one of those uh, people. They are uh, currently in Kibbutz Shfaim. There's a guest house there, and they're all uh, staying in the same place. So on a technical level, we put together a fund, and we will also have national backing um, to uh, help us with resources that we need to to rehabilitate this community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ironically, there's a lot of expertise at Sapir College when it comes to trauma and resiliency because uh, because that's the area we live in, and the School of Social Work has a lot of professionals uh, for whom this is um, this is a very big expertise. So uh, we're going to, as always, use our what we call our indigenous knowledge and uh, and um, and recruit that for the rehabilitation process. That's on a you know fundraising level. Mm-hmm. Um, Listening to the news and uh, following what's going on in social media and listening to experiences of Jewish students in U.S. campuses and campuses across the world, I think that on an academic level, it's also important to take it into the classrooms and, um, and, you know, take it as a critical thinking exercise to do with your students because in the near future, if it's not happening already, um, which will still be a long and you know bloody present progressive for us, the media will be featuring tons of scholarly and journalistic articles that attempt to frame or interpret or explain the massacre. And this is a very dangerous discourse because um, you know if you're tempted to read and engage with any of those, you you. You must look out for your own soul. You know, you must be able to zoom out and say, wait a minute, hang on. Don't confuse me because I know who the bad guys are. It's in my face. And it's not something I want to be confused about. Uh, Because if I am, that's when I lose myself because it undermines my very existence as a human being. So I, I think it's very important to bring that into the classroom and have real conversations with students who are supporting this or that and um, call their critical thinking skills to attention. Um, This is what we need from you. And we need to keep on voicing that and to keep and, and, and not to be dragged into a discourse that attempts to contextualize and explain such a massacre. It doesn't, it needs no explanation. It's pure, it's it's absolute evil. It's not relative evil. It's not contextualized evil. It's not uh, relatable evil. It's absolute evil. And it has to be treated this way. Um, so, you know, I'm just... Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, my feet. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Um, uh, Hila and Galia, can you s- tell us a, a few words about Yuri, uh, where he is now, and uh, what are his options and prospects? Is he? Um, he has no family. Is he t- together with one of the community groups that uh, Amit mentioned? I mean, I don't know if you can share this level of personal information, of course, to protect him, but uh, just so long, so much as you can share. So he's right now in the center in Kibbutz Shfaim. Um, the whole situation here is very complicated because it's not it's not a few hundreds. We're talking about um, 120,000 people right now who evacuated from their houses. Some of them can come back to their houses, especially um, in the south. Um, and the, we don't know what's going to happen right now. People are, you know, they're just a lot of volunteering, a lot of people are just coming and trying to help them. We still don't know how, you know, where where this war is going to. Um, so people right now only, you know, processing, um, trying to feel a bit better. We're still somebody that they couldn't found, still people that are missing. So it's, I know it's been over two weeks and it's like, okay, so what's next? But um, most of the country is still recovering. Um, 
and and we're not there yet. The government is not there yet, um, and hopefully we we all know better soon. Thank you. What, what Thank are you. the options? What you know? He has no car, no house. Like, but there are so many. It's not Yuri is. It's a very good example that, you know, it, it's one story. There are so many stories. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so many people that, okay, uh, what, what am, uh, are people are coming back to their houses? Some traumas are so big that they don't know if they come back. Some people must come back. It's very individual. Um, and I think time will tell. Thank you. Thank you, Gaia. Um, Shlomi, I don't know if you want to engage this. Uh, but I did want to ask you particularly on uh, on the last comment uh, that you ended your uh, introductory notes with. And you, you said, we will come back, but we will be changed. We will not be the same. Um, uh, how do you think, I mean, are you even, if you're even in that mindset to think about how you will enter Sapir again, the same coffee, the cafeteria where you share those gossips with the office, the classroom. Um, are you even there yet mentally to think about how you will be again a faculty member at Sapir? Definitely. Mm -hmm. That's one one of the things that keeps you moving on forward. I mean, that we, we haven't been really... Uh, academically disciplined for the last two or three weeks. I mean, we haven't really researched. Um, we, we are contemplating about what's going on. We are all traumatized, that's for sure. And we have to remember, um, we, I'm not sure. I mean, the war is started, but, um, there are, there probably will be an incursion and so on. So, uh, there are sirens all the time. Uh, we're still in war, but, yeah, we have to think about the future. I mean, this is, you know, that's part of being an Israeli, uh, part of the, let's say, the the model of the Zionist movement. You have to keep going forward. So, um, although this is a, a true catastrophe, there's no question about it. Um, we know what is Sapil's goal. And we'll, we'll, that, that is, that's not just the motto. That is the spirit, spirit that Amit uh, mentioned before. How we will do that, do that in details. How we will change our programs. Will the <laughs> law faculty will go into more, uh, uh, in, will develop more interest in international law. Um, will we have more collaborations? I don't know. That's something we'll have to talk about. But for sure, uh, things will be different all around, uh, the area, not just in campus. For sure. I mean, all of you mentioned several times the Sapir spirit, the Sapir culture, if you will, as, and Sapir itself being a microcosm of Israel with its extremely, if not the most diverse student and staff uh, populations. Um, can you tell us about how these different constituencies experiencing and processing both the trauma and this uh, looming war that you just referred to, Shlomi? I mean, for example, uh, you mentioned that you have a significant, the different student uh, populations, you have religious, secular, formerly religious like Yuri, you have Arabs, Jews. Um, what's the sense uh, in the, among the students, Sapir, um, Sapir student population? Um, is there a sense that as we are getting it from you, that we are all in it together and together we need to rebuild in the true Israeli spirit, um, the Sapir, the Sapir spirit and Sapir itself? Or uh, is there, or if the trauma is so deep that uh, the divisions are more, uh, more uh, prevalent? Um, you, can you give us a sense of how prof how staff and students uh, and their different populations are dealing with this? Again, we are following the news, and the news only tell us so much about how Israeli society and its different constituencies react. Um, 
if you could illustrate this from Sapir, that I think would be. Very I'm sure that Amit would, would like to say something about that, but uh, let me just say something really brief because, again, I'm not in Israel. I've been using my WhatsApp all the time and writing to students and so on, which I think is also, even in Israeli academia, I'm not sure it's so common that you will, a lecturer will uh, write WhatsApp to students, making sure that they're okay. Um, I wanted to, to, to say something that maybe I'm not sure if it's in the news or not, other than the, the fact that there are something like 120 Israelis refugees right now scattered, scattered all around Israel. Um, almost 40, uh, Bedouins were killed or kidnapped, uh, during this horrific terror attack. And 15% of the students in Sapir are Bedouins. 15. Um, 15%. 15, 15. Yeah. And uh, there was a specific tribe that suffered uh, tremendous loss. And we, I, I recognize the name. So I know that we have students that were part of this tribe. Um, I don't know how things... Will, how will will be the reignition process, but I I know that it will happen. Um, that's it for me now. Shtomi, will they come back to Sapir? Will they come Let, back? I, I, I'll answer that in a more general way. Okay. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Let's take it a bit up. Um. I think that maybe the international media don't understand that um, people, uh, the people in, in Israel, I think, as I understand it, is pretty much united in, in the in notion that uh, we will not be, uh, the Hamas will not be again sitting on a, a tower close to Nativa Sara, which is a Moshav. Um, things will be different and people will not come back to their homes if things will be the same. So the general question is if, is if that will be taken care of because uh, Sapir doesn't exist if the kibbutzim and the moshavim and the towns around it won't be there. That's pretty simple, yeah. I think. Amit, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely right, yeah. So just, uh, it's a good question, Chava. It's a very good question. You know, right now we stand united and um, there are many support circles and support groups which have formed formally and informally in the Sapil community. Professors and students together, I can just tell you personally that my son, my son lives in Tel Aviv. He uh, cleared his apartment so two of my students could go in there. They're from Sderot because they were sort of stuck. They had nowhere to go. So students of ours are living, you know, yeah. in my son's yeah. apartment. That's the level of standing together. And in those groups, um, the, the Bedouin community of students is uh, quite active and they're there. And we're supporting them as well. Um, we are used to, you know, running a campus which has multiple layers of sensitivities among different groups. So intercultural awareness, inclusion, um, this is this is part of what we do uh -huh. on a regular basis. Yeah. Having said that, yeah, we are expecting sensitivities. Uh, we are expecting difficulties to arise. Um, they will definitely be back, the Bedouin students, together with the Jewish students. I don't think that's a question. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, Shlomi. I don't think that's a question because they have an extensive academic and social support mechanism which was developed specifically for their needs so that they can, you know, be first-generation students and actually yeah. uh, uh, be able to graduate and continue with on with graduate degrees and sometimes, you know, uh, PhD level. So... This is this is their home as well. Um, 
if it's going to be easy and smooth, no, I don't think so. But they will be back with us because they're they're a part of us. Um, I can't imagine the campus without them. I would also like to add, um, Thank you. I don't know if uh, you watched uh, Biden's uh, speech, but you ask um, we all did, if I you think. see the, the students, if they're going to come back. And I think all Israeli, that's how he feels. Um, he talked about our secret weapon, uh, that we have no play, other place to go to. We have to stay here and we have to stay strong. And we, we, we're going to be stronger after. And we're going to, you know, hopefully the population will be back in the kibbutzim, in the areas, and hopefully we're going to build it again. Uh, but I don't think... Uh, that we as a nation see an option not not coming back, not rebuilding the area, and not you know trying to make a brighter future for for the students, for the citizens, and and for a country. Yeah. And um, you probably know that we have over the years uh, been working closely with some of your colleagues, uh, international research exchange, and uh, we certainly look forward to doing that and more of that. And um, if and to the extent that internationalization can be part of this rebuilding, please do know uh, that you have uh, colleagues and friends and other institutions such as ours um, being there to, to help and, uh, and be part of that process, uh, to help your students, your colleagues, um, our colleagues. Uh, so um, we'd like to be part of that. We want to be part of that. And maybe just one last question before I would turn it over to the audience and the chat. Um, Hila, if I could put you on the spot, uh, because you are a product of Sapir, you actually graduated from Sapir, so you are now, and the work that you do, the voluntary work that, that you do, is, I imagine, something that you learned, that you were trained, that now what, what you gained from Sapir, now you're going to, uh, are able to put to practical uh, application. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what that work is, what you studied in Sapir and what you do now? And Galia, if you want, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I studied in Sapir, uh, like Galia said. Uh, Lee, how do you say it in English? Public uh... policy. Public policy. Policy. And policy um... analysis. And now um, it's, it's very hard to live now in Israel and all the works, a lot of works, it's a little bit complicated to, to continue the way it was before. And I work in, a, in events venues. Uh, so we do uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs and uh, um, a lot of... Uh, events in our place um, and now we can't do anything um, even if we, we are in the center of Israel and and we can't do anything because uh, uh, the condition and um, we don't have work now uh, we have uh, 200 uh, employees that can't work right now and we're trying to understand what can we do so in this the uh, two uh, few weeks. I'm sorry about my English, but in the no, two few weeks, uh, <laughs> we are volunteers. Uh, we have volunteers uh, to do a food from uh, the people uh, that can't live in their homes anymore, and for the for the soldiers uh, in the army, and. Um, and now we have to to think like a lot of people in this country uh, what we are going to do how can we how the 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 business can survive and how we can uh, uh, pay rent and uh, everything because all of this country is like in a big problem, uh, my sister my sister uh, lives in the north in Metula. It's near uh, Lebanon, and she also uh, can't leave. Uh, the uh, she has to leave her house and my uh, mother too from a uh, other place in the north. So everything in, <laughs> in this uh, country is like a <laughs> big uh, big problem. 
and uh, we're trying to do the the best we can t- and also uh, take care of our uh, friends and also go to a funerals and <laughs> and so it's very complicated uh, thing right now thank you Helen thank you very much and uh, even in this time of adversity I mean just what you do and what you have made the Your company do and move immediately to respond to the needs of society I think is just a beautiful and very inspiring testimony to to that sapphir to the legacy of that sapphir spirit that that you were part of uh, when you were a student and now your um, your society and your community and the nation really is benefiting from your uh, adaptability and 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 your readiness to to stand up uh, to the need of the hour so thank you for sharing that I uh, You're, at, um, you're a model student, a model graduate, uh, so thank you. Uh, Lihi, I see you have your hand, and I would like to invite members of the audience to please put your questions, comments in the chat. We have about just under 10 minutes uh, to, to respond and discuss your, uh, your comments and questions. Lihi, please. Uh, as you know, Chaba, I wasn't sure that I can and can actually speak during this time uh, with all the devastated uh, thing that we we've been through. But uh, I just want to say first of all, thank you uh, for the, this event and the opportunity to uh, bring our voices uh, to to people around the world to hear uh, what really you know what what happened and and how things are uh, um, being. how we try to deal with this uh, terrible and horrific uh, situation. I just want to uh, uh, and, and of course to my colleague that uh, uh, that that are here with me so thank you uh, for, for for your effort. I just want to say two things. We reach each and every student in Sapir, almost everyone that we could talk to. Uh, all the lecturers in Sapir uh, contact their student. And uh, we uh, promised them that we are here for them and we're trying to do everything for the community. And another thing that is important that we in Sapir, we haven't heard any expression of, you know, uh, people supporting this ma- massacre or something. So even though we're, I think, one of the most uh, diverse colleges in Israel, if not the most one, as, as my colleague already said, Uh, I think that there's something here uh, in Sapir that that uh, that a little bit different and I think that this specific uh, and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter where are you from what do you think what are your beliefs uh, at this moment uh, all the people around me and uh, and and everyone for me everyone are the same uh, we are really devastated from from for, for, from what happened. I must say that I thought I would I will go back straight ahead to teach in Sapir and and I, I wasn't aware that people are actually afraid to physically be there so we're going to start probably we're going to start the semester uh, virtually but I for me there's no other option we have to be strong we have to go uh, beyond that we have to rebuild our area and our college again. And I think that we can definitely do it. We need a lot of collaboration as as and and support, but I think that we have a specific and important role, and we shouldn't uh, let anyone uh, broke this uh, vision and and, uh, and think that uh, yeah and that and that spirit. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lehi. What a beautiful, beautiful, and again, very inspiring point uh, to add. We had a very strong expression of interest. Um, not everybody can, of course, be here. So if uh, people would like to follow up with questions, comments, we are always very happy to facilitate uh, the interaction. And uh, in particular, those who would like to know more about the various uh, uh, giving opportunities, um, if you need more, would like to know more information about the funds that Amit and Galia and Hila mentioned, either about Sapir or Yuri, Uh, they are in the chat and we are always very happy to facilitate that information and let me just add from our perspective at the Institute and Concordia uh, Amit since you mentioned made reference to Nativ Hasara it is a community that during one of our summer schools we have a, a summer school when I um, 
fortunate to bring a group of our students to Israel and we always go to the Negev and every year we visit some other part of the Negev but one year we visited Natif Hasara and it's just uh, it breaks the heart is not the expression it's just indescribable uh, to see that where we stood is where we talked to people where we heard about the story of Natif Hasara which is really quite an interesting one how it came about, why it came about, and what happened there now. I mean, it really brings the the tragedy of this massacre um, alive to our students, certainly those who participated in, uh, in that program. So there are very concrete ways in which uh, many of us here too uh, feel the pain. Um, but um, without then uh, any further uh, ado, I'm going to um, thank everyone and certainly our friends and uh, and colleagues from uh, from Sapir, from the administration and the staff, uh, Amit, Lihi, uh, the, the faculty who are now representing Sapir abroad, Shlomi, um, and of course the uh, Gary. I don't know your status at Sapir. I, I only know you as uh, Hila's friend. But Hila, of course, uh, representing the student body, we really heard uh, a very, very uh, meaningful and uh, an excellent uh, description uh, and portrayal of what Sapir yeah, has been going through from different vantage points, from the different um, constituencies that you represent at the college. So uh, we wish you uh, all the strength uh, as you um, as you embark on rebuilding and as you are facing. Uh, the next stages of um, uh, of the aftermath uh, of the massacre. And uh, again, please note that we are here to think together with you about how internationalization can be perhaps a tool in uh, rethinking and, and helping in uh, in rebuilding uh, the, uh, the community. As you know, um, the, the community in Montreal has been very strongly invested in working with communities in the Negev. So um, whatever we can do, uh, we are here to, um, to help. So um, we are working, we're, we'll continue our collaborations. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us uh, once again. And, uh, and uh, friends uh, in the audience, uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming you at our next event on Wednesday, which will be in person at Concordia, talking about Jews, Zionism from Latin America to Israel. And um, to our friends in Sapir, um, a quiet evening. I think this is the best uh, and perhaps the most appropriate that we can wish. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Thank you very much.